Tonight, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. See the earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, Christ our King is Sing the God, give to His holy name. I God shall, Jesus will guard His children. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time tonight. Lord, we thank you for all of those that are in your house tonight, Lord. I thank you for the, the wonderful week of missions conference that we've had. I pray that you would continue to bless those commitments that were made this morning and those that continue to come in over the coming weeks. 
Lord, I pray that you would meet with us tonight, Lord, that you would continue to burden our hearts for missions, and that maybe even tonight someone would say, Lord, I will go, and uh, we'll just trust you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Our, kids, our preschool choir is going to sing at this time. I'm excited about Project 938. I'm excited about Project 938. I'm a missionary in Tanzania, East Africa. My name is Nathan Fultz, and my family and I have been over there in Tanzania for quite some time now. And we're excited because there is a lot of work to do in the mission field. We are in Tanzania, and we need missionaries. We're in Eastern Africa. We need missionaries there. Out in the world, the, the world needs missionaries. My prayer is that you could consider praying for more missionaries from right here so that we can go out because the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Would you consider being a prayer partner to be able to pray for missionaries? Maybe even you yourself, the Lord would call to be a missionary around the world. asking the Lord to burden our hearts, to challenge our hearts uh, for the cause of missions. And just like those little kids saying, don't disobey the Lord. Obey God immediately. And whatever he's asking you to do, uh, we would uh, echo that and say, follow the Lord with all of your heart. We're glad that you're here tonight. We've got more missions to talk about tonight and next Sunday. Uh, we're going to talk about our Project 38 initiative there, praying uh, for God to, to send laborers into the harvest all around the world. We're looking forward to that. If you're here tonight for the first time watching online or in our sanctuary, we are glad that you are here. And we would ask that you would text the word hello to the church number. That would give us the opportunity uh, to send you uh, a link to the digital guest card. You could complete that, uh, that form and give us a chance to say thank you for being a part of what's going on here at Cherry Street or joining us tonight. If you're in the sanctuary and uh, you want to reach in front of you and grab that card out of the seat back pocket, you can complete that card and put it in one of the offering boxes either in the foyer or here in the back of the auditorium. And again, gives us a chance to say thank you for joining us, and we're looking forward uh, to what God is doing. As we've been talking about missions, a lot has gone into this week. And for those of you that have had a part in serving or, or preparing or setting up or tearing down or cleaning up or cooking, any part that you have, we want to make sure that uh, you know that we are grateful for your ministry uh, to our missions conference this week. Thank you very, very much. And tomorrow night, our GROW ministry will resume, 645 in the Gilming Center. We want you to be a part of reaching our Jerusalem. Uh, so as you have opportunity, come and be a part of our GROW ministry uh, tomorrow night at 645. Prime timers, you all will meet at 1030 Tuesday morning. And the theme is Going Beyond. Going beyond. So you want to come and, and be a part of that. Make sure you sign up out in the foyer as a bill can be prepared to take you somewhere beyond where you think you're going to be. All right. So uh, you, you have a good time with that. All right. Uh, also, our next steps classes are, are opening sign ups. Our sign ups are open for our next steps classes, our foundations class and our uh, to the Christian life and our foundations for serving or improving your serve classes will restart on October the 13th, Wednesday 
Wednesday night, October 13th. And so if you're interested in joining those classes, you'll need to sign up. Text the word NEXT uh, to the church number and sign up for those classes. We want everyone to do, be a part of our Next Steps classes. Also, uh, we'll start a new series and walking in confidence uh, in, in the Next Steps class that Brother Ray teaches. And so please sign up for those so we can be prepared for you. And we want everyone, like we said, to be a part of seeking the Lord's face on what your next step in your walk with him is. All right. And then Grief Share Ministry, that will continue on Thursday night in the Fellowship Hall at 6 o'clock. If you're part of the Grief Share Ministry, if you're interested in being a part of the Grief Share Ministry, that will meet at 6 o'clock. And then I'm excited about this new Foundation Stone series, Foundation Stones for the Family, that will begin on Sunday evening, October the 10th. You'll want to make time and make that a priority. Uh, Ten uh, important foundational uh, principles uh, to make your family a family that honors the Lord and can grow and, and be a part of what God has for you. And so you'll come and be a part of those uh, over the next several weeks. And then as always, we are grateful uh, for your giving, your faithfulness in giving. Thank you uh, for making uh, the ministry here at Cherry Street a successful one in that you trust the Lord. You give your tithes, your offerings, your missions, and we're able to do much more together uh, than we can do on our own. And we're thankful for that. You can give one of three ways. You can give online through our uh, website and click on the giving tab. You can give through the Realm Connect app and set up regular gifts through that or, or give one time or give as much or as, as, as much as you want to. And so you can do that. Or you can uh, take one of our envelopes that are postage paid, self-addressed envelopes. You can give through those, put those in the offering boxes or put them in the mail. If you're watching from home, not able to return uh, yet to services in person, uh, you can give your offering that way as well. Either way, we trust the Lord uh, and, and to use our faithfulness to him and to accomplish great things. Micah.
Christians, be glad. Sing and lift your voices to the Lord. Let the glory of the Lord forever be our joy. May redemption be the theme of our song. For by grace we have been saved, and by grace we shall proclaim to the corners of the earth that Christ is come. seated. Well, it has been a great mission conference, and we have been excited for this entire week, and I'm glad you're back tonight. We have our newest missionaries that are sent out of Cherry Street Baptist Church that are uh, that were recognized on Wednesday of this week. John and Olivia, come up if you would, please. Uh, John and Olivia Solomon, they have been so faithful uh, in our church for so many years. These guys have done junior church. Uh, they have talked to your kids. They have, they have loved on your kids. They have taught uh, your children in the junior churches. And we are just so proud of them and excited for what the Lord has been doing and will continue to do. Uh, they actually start their deputation right away next weekend, right? You've got their first... Uh, their first booking next weekend. So they're, they're going to be in and out uh, over the next couple of months. The goal will be for them to fill the calendar and uh, be gone 
uh, at the new year and be full-time on the road. And uh, they're, they're looking forward to a great time. Now, they're a little different. <laughs> Let me say it a different way. Their circumstance is a little different than most of the missionaries that we've sent out because uh, the missionaries like Kevin Adams, poor Kevin Adams back here, uh, Kevin is here and he is doing his internship uh, with us. And so he is, Kevin's got to put in his time and then uh, he will be approved, Lord willing, uh, Lord willing, he will be approved as a career missionary. I know John's going, yeah, I, and I'm with you, John. Trust me, I'm with you. Uh, but uh, that will be Kevin's role over the next year. Kevin is working really hard uh, in, to learn the, the work of the ministry. Kevin said to me, well, I've grown up in church all my life. That's, that's training. You have no idea, buddy. I'm just telling you right now, it's a lot different. And he's already doing a great job, by the way. John and Olivia, however, haven't had this opportunity yet. And so they're going to work uh, with his mom and dad uh, down in Chile. And they're going to do a fantastic job. And so would you just uh, help me uh, to... First of all, let's just be thankful for these guys. They have served so faithfully here. And then welcome them this, this evening as they share their testimony with us. Come right ahead, John, Olivia. We'd actually like to show our video first and share that with you. And then I'd like to say a few words. Hi, I'm John. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Olivia. I'm Isaiah. I'm Malaya. And we're the Solomons, intern missionaries to Chile. Chile is a country of extremes. It is the longest country on the globe, with the driest desert in the world in the north, and Tierra del Fuego being the cold home to the southernmost city on Earth. The Andes Mountains run along the eastern border, opposing the rocky shore to the west, with the frigid waters from the Humboldt Current lapping upon its shore. You can see the power and majesty of God in the rugged beauty of this extreme land. But that is not why God has called us to this incredible country. While many surveys and websites will tell you that Chile is a Christian country, claiming that many are Catholic, the truth is that most of the population will tell you in a moment of honesty that they do not believe in God at all. I was blessed to have been raised in a Christian home with parents who serve the Lord every week in our local church. We had missionaries come into my church all the time, and I always thought, I could never do that. <laughs> I always thought I was too introverted and too shy to go to a foreign land and tell people about Jesus. John and I hadn't been dating for very long, and I was in college pursuing an English education degree when I spoke to his parents about their ministry in Santiago. They told me about an outreach they were doing, about how they were teaching the Chilean people English using the Gospel of Mark. As an English education major, that really struck my heart. And that was the first time I thought, wow, I could do that. Following that conversation, I prayed for several weeks. And God kept bringing to mind all the ways that He had prepared me to go to a Spanish-speaking country as a missionary. Not only that, but He was calling me to the country of Chile. God began calling me to full-time ministry at a young age. As the years went on, I began to struggle against that call, wanting to mix it with whatever I wanted to do, whether that was a firefighter or maybe a soccer player at the time. But when it came time to pick a college, I knew God wanted me to go to Baptist Bible College, and I knew He wanted me to be a missionary. And so I surrendered to that calling. And I told God I would go anywhere He wanted me to go and do anything He wanted me to do. But I didn't know where that would be. And so as missionaries came through and spoke at church or in chapel at BBC or in some of my classes, I wanted to talk to them, interview them, ask them questions, take them out to lunch. And I hoped that God would lay one of their countries on my heart. But it wasn't until I started dating Olivia, and it wasn't long after I started dating her, that God called me to the country of Chile. One evening, we sat down to share with each other about what God had been doing in our hearts and how He was calling us to the mission field. We were elated to find out that He had called us both to the same country, Chile. 
We're excited to be serving alongside my parents, veteran missionaries Joel and Wendy Solomon in the capital city of Santiago, Chile. They've been missionaries for 30 years, 17 of which have been in Chile. While we're there, we're going to be going to language school, acclimating to the culture, and ministering to the people as soon as we can. We plan on starting Bible studies, growing the children's ministry, and discipling new believers. Please partner with us by praying for us. Pray for us as we get used to the new culture, as we learn the language, and as we start ministering to the people. Pray for us as we raise the funds we need to live in Chile. And please give so that we can go, so that they can hear the gospel. You can make an eternal difference in the lives of the Chilean people as we take the light of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I woke up this morning way before my alarm, which is pretty annoying. Beyond that, I had a song stuck in my head, which can also be annoying sometimes. However, this one wasn't so bad. It was a snippet of a hymn that says, it goes something like, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me that I may ever do my part to win that soul for thee. And that is what it's all about. And that's why we do all of this, and it's why we're going to Chile. Cherry Street, you know us. You have laughed with us. You've cried with us. You've watched my son get taller and taller and taller than me. <laughs> You've watched my youngest son run circles around us with more energy than should be able to fit in a little boy of that size. And you have loved us. And so we want to say thank you. Thank you for your love and your support. And we hope that you will continue to support us and encourage us as we enter this new phase of our ministry, as we go to other churches and ask them to partner with you in your support of us, and as we then head to Chile to tell them about the gospel so that they can then spend eternity in heaven because nothing is more important than that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you, John. Appreciate that so much. Now, a couple of uh, things uh, to, just to mention to you. First of all, uh, you heard what he said. We, we need you to continue to support us, to encourage us. They're not talking about just writing them a check every month. Uh, they're talking about us praying for them and caring for them and encouraging them along the way. They, uh, there are groups out there that do not, uh, uh, they don't send their missionaries on deputation. Their missionaries become an employee of a denomination. And uh, what I appreciate about the process that we use, first of all, I believe it's, it is uh, uh, very, very clearly laid out in the New Testament. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul went from place to place to place. Uh, churches like uh, the churches in Macedonia sent a time and again to, to meet his need, as we talked about this morning. And, uh, but what happens in the lives of the missionaries on deputation is that they, they learn something that is absolutely essential for every missionary to know. And that is, we can trust God to take care of us. That's what it's about. It's not just about raising their support. It's about learning down deep uh, in a very, very tangible way. We can trust God uh, to take care of us. And so, as a church family... Uh, we want to pray for them, and we want to care for them, and we want to encourage them. That's what our scent teams are all about. If you would uh, just take a look one more time at this scent teams video. Some of you were in other places this morning. You didn't get a chance to see this. Just watch this one-minute video, if you would, please. <music>
can pray for somebody else. Every person can send a note of encouragement. Every person uh, can show that they care. And so uh, I, I hope that you will uh, get involved with these sent teams. And uh, it's a blessing. The missionaries I've heard over and over and over again from our missionaries down through the years since we've been doing this, what a blessing it has been uh, for those missionaries who have needed someone at a particular time. Praise the Lord. They've got uh, the sent team that can be rallied in just a moment's notice. And so I want to thank you ahead of time. Be a part of a sent team. Thank you for doing so. Tonight, we have a very, very special uh, video that we want to watch. Normally, um, I mean, when I was a kid, we, when we had a movie at church, it was, uh, uh, what was the Distant Thunder? What was the one before that one? The Thief in the Night. Uh, anybody remember a thief in the night? Yeah, buddy, scared the pants off me. Uh, I thought Jesus was coming before the night was over, and he hasn't, but he might tonight, you know. He could come tonight. Uh, but uh, then I came to Cherry Street Baptist Church, and Dr. Gilming showed a, a, uh, a film on the... Um, on the prodigal son, no, it's my son, my son. It was uh, it was a film about uh, David and Absalom. Do you remember that that one, Ray? Doctor Gilming showed that one. It was pretty powerful. It was really bad, but it, I mean, it was it wasn't a good movie as far as the quality of the movie is concerned. Uh, but it was uh, it wasn't <laughs> it was it was still moving. Everybody's crying when it was over the moving thing. Uh, but um, but I will tell you. It's been a long time since I've seen anything that I believe is going to be more uh, touching and more pertinent to what we're talking about. Tonight is the last service of our Faith Promise Conference, Mission 937. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous and the laborers are few. And next Sunday, we will kick off Project 938 and we're going to ask you to pray because the very next verse says, pray ye therefore, this is what Jesus was asking us to do, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And I don't think that, uh, that we can be uh, better pointed in that direction than to watch this particular uh, video. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, the, the mission office's original Marjorie Browning video. This has been redone and, and put into more of a, of a documentary type uh, uh, video, and it's very powerful. So would you uh, sit back and eat your imaginary popcorn and watch this video if you would, please. called to the mission field, but I didn't know it would be Brazil. I just knew that God wanted me on some mission field. And so I surrendered to go anywhere he would call me. And it wasn't until the second year of Bible college that I felt really impressed by the Holy Spirit that the deal would be the field. Many have wondered, how does a girl who grew up in Southwest Missouri and then worked as a legal secretary find herself years later in a remote swamp in Brazil, South America? High Streets have the privilege to be the sending church of a lot of missionaries over the years. But there's none that we're more proud to say we were the sending church than Marjorie Browning. Her family moved to Springfield when she was in high school because her dad wanted them to attend High Street as a family. 
Marjorie was to get married, but then was diagnosed with a fatal disease. So she broke off the engagement, not wanting to put the young man through that experience. It ended up being a misdiagnosis. She still went on to Bible college to follow God's call upon her life. I went to that Bible College in Springfield, Missouri and graduated in 1957. She started feeling called to missions, then she felt called to Brazil, and then she first went to Brazil in 1960. Before I came to Brazil, thought about how long will I stay. To me, it was going to be my life work. What I've done all these years has just been part of my life. It, it's something that I feel God called me to do. When I left the States to come to Brazil, in 1960, I had a promise of $200 a month. My support was sufficient then, even being in language school, and it has been up to now. It has increased. I never visited new churches to raise more support on the furloughs I went back, but for some reason it has increased along with the needs. And now my support would be normally between $1,200 and $1,300 a month. When you think about Marjorie, you have to think of a faithful person. She knew what God called her to do. She followed that call and she went to Brazil. She was determined to make a difference in the lives of many Brazilians, no matter what difficulties she would encounter. Marjorie has been a wonderful example of dedication, faithfulness, and service for all of us. Before Marjorie moved to a remote area of Brazil, she lived and worked in Sao Paulo for 13 years. Marjorie joined up with BBFI missionaries, the Bartons, traveling by Jeep or other means deep into Brazil's northern interior to assist a Bible Institute graduate in starting a church, one of many that the Bartons helped establish in that area. Marjorie followed God's leading to move to that undeveloped area to a small town called Novalanda in 1973. It's in that northern region where God has used Marjorie to impact lives of many people. Her ministry has encouraged the churches as they have grown and reached out into other small towns. However, Marjorie was ready to reach out even further, further than most others would, to a place that was mostly unreached. I was helping in a church in Nova Holanda where I'd been for many years. And I had been here in the swamps on trips, horseback trips, and I saw the need here because service would, services would be held here occasionally, but there was no one living here in the meantime to encourage the people that would be saved or that would need to keep on hearing the gospel. And uh, when I told the people of the church my plans, the pastor, even from the pulpit, gave me some pretty strong advice that I should not come here, I should stay there. I told them at that time I was willing to stay there or come here. If they had a couple in the church or a person who would be willing to come and work in the swamp, I would be willing to stay there. But no one volunteered, so I did. I knew what it was like, but I was determined that uh, I would get used to it, I'd become accustomed. And, uh, if all the other people can leave here, why can't I? I'm a human being also. So I really didn't leave with any fear of anything up here, more than a fear that I'd have in any, anywhere else I would live. The only uh, thing that has been harder, and especially since I've moved over to the swamp, is the lack of communication. Marjorie lives in one of those areas where you literally can't get there from here. The name of this place is called Two Brothers Swamp. This is a farming area, some might say, but really, this area is not even good for most crops. The main thing they raise there is sugar cane, and most of the people make liquor from the sugar cane. I traveled in the back of a pickup truck with Dr. Baird, our former mission director, for over 300 miles through sand and rugged terrain. It was pretty remote for sure. One of the most exciting trips that my wife and my daughters and I ever had was we were able to go see Marjorie um, 
where she lived there in the interior of Brazil. There was not a much harder place to get to than where she lived. And she would always tell us, you can't get here. And we found out you almost really can't get there, but we, we were able to make it. It was very exciting to see her works. We met her first when Bob spoke at a missionary retreat in Brazil. And we stayed in a two bedroom home with Marjorie. We got to know her quite well, and so Bob told her, he said, we're gonna come to visit you. And she said, no, you won't. She said, nobody from the States has ever come to visit me. But we did. My amazement of her and my appreciation of her grew by leaps and bounds the time we were on that trip. Everybody there in that little village, it wasn't even much of a village, but they loved her and she loved them and the children loved her. As Ascending Church, you know, we take responsibility for our missionaries and we want to help them uh, not only get to the field, we obviously want to help them with financial support, but we also want to help them with special projects. You know, we've had a lot of missionaries ask us for help with vehicles, for different things, but with Marjorie, her need was a horse. And so once we were able to help her buy a horse, uh, we actually gave her more money than she needed and she wouldn't keep it, so she sent it back for us to use for another mission project. I always make my trips to Nova London by horse because of the distance. Retrieving the mail was always an adventure for Marjorie. Her mail was normally delivered to Nova Londa. Now remember, it was eight hours away by horse. It's deep sand beginning here. When I get over to the next swamp where we have a church, uh, I always stop there so that my horse can rest a little. I usually need to see somebody there. Horseback trips involved more than just saddling up her horse and taking off. At first, Marjorie didn't even have a fenced pasture where she kept her horse. She just turned it loose to graze out in the open. So when I get ready a day before, usually before a long trip, I go out looking for my horse. I always put a bell around his neck so it's not too hard to find. I can hear him if I'm, at least if I'm close enough. And I have to go bring my horse in, feed him, take them down to the river and wash them and get them ready for the trip the next day. After our visit in 2002, we returned and told her story to her sending church. For a long time, she would have to go out with a bell and find her horse because there was no fencing, there was no area to keep it. So we helped her buy a piece of land so she could keep her horse and she wouldn't have to spend several hours each time she needed to go for a ride to another village to check on another ministry, and she was able to get that quicker so that she could make her trip. Eventually, she got cancer of the tongue. Half of it was removed, and it changed her speech a little. We went to Dallas to see her in the hospital. Then not too long after that, she came to Springfield to see Bob and told him that she was going to go back to Brazil. He did his very dead level best to talk her into staying a little longer to where she could recuperate better and, and get her strength back. But she told him, she said, Brother Baird, I love you, but I, I'm going back now. And she did. There were times that I would say, Marjorie, won't you come back to the States and take a little break? She said, why? This is home. This is where I belong. This is where I want to live. And this is where I want to die. When I have some minor illness, I, I have a medical book. I look in it and take some pills if I need to. Only one time I had to make a trip out of here. About two years ago, I had a high fever for 12 days and I took antibiotics and I didn't do anything for it so I had to make a trip out to Hemus, which is also the town where I go to a bank, went to a doctor. Luckily a, a car did come here after a uh, pickup after 12 days I was able to get out and go to a doctor. But there is no medical facility of any kind here. The most accommodating area of her home 
is the one she uses for ministry. It's just a plain building with a small area for her to cook and live in with a few extra rooms to do ministry. Uh, she had no vehicle. Well, for that matter, she had no running water. She had no electricity. She had no uh, transportation of any sort. She had no mail delivery. I have a good place for washing dishes. It's actually outside on an open back porch. There's really no electricity here, but I do have a sol solar panel, which gives lighting at night, except in the rainy seasons when the battery runs down sometimes there's no light. I have a little kitchen about five by eight feet where I have a small stove and a little space to work in. The stove I have is uh, a small butane gas stove. During the rainy season, getting water is no problem. I have a barrel that catches water from the roof. But most of the time it doesn't rain here, so I make trips with two buckets down to the creek to carry water back from all of my needs. I also have a small bedroom, a little larger than the kitchen, and I sleep on a small folding cot with a, a mattress about that thick, an inch maybe. But it's comfortable. Marjorie was one of the most unique people I have ever met. How she was so loving and kind and, and uh, never complained. She was a faithful person and she knew what God had called her to do. She was one of the happiest people I ever met. And she had a great sense of humor. She was, a, she was a, an amazing person. When Dr. Baird and I arrived and stayed there in Two Brothers Swamp with Marjorie Browning, she had her little area where she lived, and she had a larger room where she had uh, the children to meet and the ladies to meet, and then another room off to the side that had two uh, wooden frames for beds, single beds. So that's where Dr. Baird and I stayed, in that small room. Well, at night, when it was dark, couldn't really see anything, we heard this noise of fluttering going on, and as I lay there, I could feel the wind brushing over my face, and it was the wind from the wings of bats. Now that was strange enough, and it was kind of hard to sleep at first, but eventually we fell asleep. So the next day, I'm thinking, where are the bats? Where did they go? So we began to look around a little bit. I went into the room, got on my knees, looked under the bed frames, and there under the bed, all the bats were hanging upside down under the bottom of the bed frame. That was pretty interesting. There are no large church buildings, no Bible colleges, no monuments that will testify of the work of Marjorie Browning, but her work is reflected in the faces of those whose lives she has touched. She always said, you know, because I can't preach, I can't be a church planter. But we were able to see a lot of churches planted because she worked with ladies and children. And then when the young men got older, they went to Bible college, they came back there and started churches. So she was a very instrumental part of starting churches all throughout the interior of Brazil. Uh, in the house I live in, there's a a fairly large room at the front and so when we have our services here or Sunday school I arrange the benches around so that people can sit down. I put floor mats down on the floor to hold the ones that there are no benches for and that's where we have our services or Sunday school. Meeting. Another important part of Marjorie's ministry is to teach the local Christians how to train and build up more disciples in their community. She always felt that this was important to keep the gospel message going from generation to generation. Every Sunday morning we have a Sunday school class for children from three years up to 15 years old or whatever age they come. And uh, also I started a ladies Bible study with one Christian lady who was living here at the time and her neighbors and anyone else who wanted to come. That's held once a week. There is no regular church service here where I live. There is no man to preach. When we have services, uh, our pastor from the next swamp over writes his mule over here. 
and has a Sunday night service and then goes back home. So it's not every Sunday. It would be every two or three weeks or whenever he can come. At the age where many are looking forward to retiring, Marjorie was still looking for new opportunities to serve. I also have known about another swamp farther away called uh, Zacharias Swamp or Salt Swamp. Over in Zacharias Swamp, there's a girl probably 22 years old who lives there. And uh, on my first visit there, or second, I became acquainted with her. She is an epileptic and uh, during an attack had fallen into fire and got a bad, bad burn on her leg. And uh, you know, there's no medical treatment in these places, so the infection became worse and worse. And, and it, uh, from what I understood, she got gangrene and so had to go to Sao Paulo for treatment. Well, the only treatment was to amputate her leg. I don't know how she can walk on crutches in the deep sand. It's hard enough with two feet. But she insists on going with me up and down the swamps with on crutches, inviting the people, giving out tracts and all, and is always present in the services also. After seeing that Marjorie's focus was more on the spiritual than on the physical, when asked about her financial needs, she replied this way. Prayer will do so much more than money well here because money will buy some things, but some things we don't even have. And uh, God through prayer can give everything you need to us. So I really appreciate it when I get a letter from somebody saying, I've been praying for you. There have been many times and uh, we're in situations where God is the only one who can help us all. Marjorie lived very meagerly without many things in her home except the necessities. On November 12, 2014, Marjorie was in her living room on her knees praying to God. A 15-year-old boy entered the house to rob her. He was startled to see her and she was startled to see him. The boy hit Marjorie over the head with a club and she died soon thereafter. Think about it this way. At one moment, she was praying to her Lord, and the next moment, she was in His presence. One of the saddest phone calls that I've ever received was when I got a call that Marjorie Browning had been killed. I wanted to try to figure out how to get back to Brazil for her funeral, but that's a country they don't embalm, and so there wasn't time. But it was just bittersweet because we know that she passed away right where she wanted to be. She went straight into the arms of her Heavenly Father. And so we know that she wouldn't change anything, even the way it happened. It was definitely a very devastating day for us uh, as a church, as her family, um, to just get that call that she had passed away. The entire town, all the surrounding area, everyone showed up for her funeral. Walking down Main Street behind her casket, going to, uh, to the graveyard, uh, was just a sight that you don't see very often. And that showed the respect that that community had for her. I was able to go back the following month to help uh, distribute uh, her affairs, uh, help with her house, just some of that. And it was, again, it was very sad, but it was just exciting to see so many people come up to me and tell me what she meant to them, how much her ministry had meant to that area, and how many people uh, had came to know Christ because of her witness and her example, and just the way that she just continually ministered throughout her 55 years in Brazil.
Marjorie's support was not very high. She didn't really feel like she needed a lot. Her support was never more than $1,200 a month. On her financial reports, she would cross out the word vehicle in the vehicle expense line and write in the word horse. Usually that expense amounted to $2.50 a month. Over the years, she would take what she had left over from her personal allowance and send it to her nephew who then invested it for her. When she passed away, her nephew called us and said, Marjorie has invested a little over the years and it has grown. He said she left directions for it. I said, that's great. You can go ahead and send it to us with her instructions. He said, I think it's a little more than what you might be thinking. It has grown to $400,000. Needless to say, I was shocked. And then he proceeded to explain that she wanted to do this to help new missionaries going to the field for the first time. She wanted those funds to pay for their airfare and their shipping of all their belongings. I was totally amazed by her desire to make a difference even after the Lord called her home. Marjorie Browning was a modern day hero in the faith. I remember the very first time I heard the name Marjorie Browning. It was in 2002, and I was at a chapel service at Baptist Bible College. They showed a video that Dr. Bob Baird had done about her. They called her the One Horse Woman. I remember being struck by her obedience to leave her home and her family to go to Brazil as a single woman. That took a lot of courage. Marjorie's obedience, kindness, generosity and strength to continue what God had called her to do has been an inspiration to my husband and me, and I am sure to many, many others. We're the Oreck family missionaries to the country of Wales. We just wanted to take the time to express our appreciation for the ministry and the legacy of Marjorie Browning. When our family moved to the country of Wales, it not only provided for us financially for our airfare, but it also paid uh, the expenses for the shipping of all of our personal belongings. It was a tremendous blessing to us and we just want to say thank you so very much for being a blessing to our family and our ministry here in the country of Wales. My name is Allie Alexander and I'm a missionary in Columbia, South America. I received help from Marjorie Browning when it came time for me to move to Bogota. I had just spent a year and a half traveling around to churches and sharing my heart for the Colombian people with them. And to know that my airfare and shipping expenses would be covered was a tremendous blessing. I cannot express how grateful I am for Marjorie Browning and the sacrifices that she made so that missionaries like myself could be blessed in this way. Marjorie Browning's life speaks clearly to that which should be important in the life of every believer, not just in the life of a missionary. First, her life portrays an unquestioning surrender of all that she is and has to the will of God. Second, she exemplifies a total commitment to the glory and honor of her Savior and the amplification of Jesus' name among a needy and remote people of the planet. And then third, she illustrates simplicity of life, an understanding and commitment to the fact that God has a high purpose for her that supersedes all other interests, including a mate, family, and material things. This produces a deep sense of fulfillment and contentment, regardless of life's circumstances. Marjorie Browning was a godly woman and she has left and is still leaving an impact on the lives of a remote people, her adopted family, who would have not known of Jesus Christ if she had not surrendered to God and gone to them. This is what Project 938 is all about, praying for more people to surrender and go to the multitudes who are searching for relief from their burdens and sins and hope of life after death. Jesus is the answer to both. His death on the cross was for our sins, and His resurrection gives us eternal life. 
There are multiplied thousands of places like the swamps of Brazil and millions of people around the world who have not yet had their Marjorie Browning come and tell them of Jesus. Would you pray for God to send more laborers and be ready if he calls you? Would you pray that those who God calls will answer the call before many people go out into everlasting eternity separated from God? If I had to do all again, all over, I would do the same thing because of, of the need and the fact that I know that the Lord wants me here and I'm perfectly happy. nine but in the previous chapter the Bible talks about the Apostle Paul is talking about the believers in Macedonia that made it possible for someone like Marjorie Browning the Apostle Paul and others to go and in verse <clears throat> number four Paul writes this, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Marjorie Browning surrendered her life to the Lord. Before she, uh, in, in order for her to do the things that she did, she certainly did not uh, go to Two Brothers Swamp because she was hoping to get in a video that we would see on a Sunday night. She went because there were people. She went further and further because she heard that there were people who had a need. She started off in the largest city and she kept going further and further until she got as far as she could go. As far as the Lord called her, she was continued continually willing to go. I, I like what she said. She said she was in that church meeting and the pastor kind of pointedly said to her, Marjorie, you should not go to that swamp. And she said, well, I'd be happy to stay if there's somebody else that would go. But since there was no one to go, she said, I went. It all boils down to this. Before we give our faith promise offerings, before we do, we do anything else, we must first give ourselves to the Lord. If you take anything away from this tonight, I want to ask you the question, does the Lord have all of you there is to have? Is there some part of your life that you're holding back? Is there something that you're saying, God, I'm willing to follow you all the way to. Is there anything that you're holding back? Maybe there's somebody here tonight who needs to take one of these faith promise cards and fill it out and, and get involved. So you know what, I can, there, there is something I can do. First, give your own self to the Lord. And then it may be as simple as God saying, okay, you need to get involved in this. You, you realize Cherry Street Baptist Church, we have a, a, a great history for years and years, long before I was ever on the scene here, uh, with Dr. Gilming and with Pastor Ken, there was a great history of missions at Cherry Street Baptist Church. There are a lot of missionaries that have been sent out of this church for years and years and years and years. We have a long history. But do you know in that same amount of time there are people who come and stay that have never one time made any kind of a faith promise commitment. Can I ask you just to consider, if you've never done that, ask yourself why. What is it that you could do what is it that you could do if the Lord spoke to your heart about it, if you would just surrender your heart to Him? We have the cards available tonight, and you can pick some of those up. 
Uh, who's got those? Raise your hand if you've got those cards, and you'll be willing to help. You don't have to pass them out right now. Just hold, hold them up, and then you guys kind of remain in place when the service is over. There's some here, some here, some here, some here. If you did not get a Faith Promise card this morning, uh, you can fill that out, and you can drop it in one of the offering boxes. But I challenge you tonight to give yourself first. That's what Marjorie Browning did. And that's what the Lord asks of every one of us. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Let's stand to our feet as we pray. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you for this life that was seemingly tragically taken. And yet, God, I thank you so much for what you did in even giving John the wisdom in his words as he said she was one moment praying before the throne of grace and the next moment she was standing face to face with the Lord. Lord, help us all to understand that one day we're going to be face to face with you. Lord, there are people around the world who need the gospel. Lord, help us to be willing to take the gospel. Help us be willing to go. Help us be willing to send. Lord, help us to be willing to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest. Father, I do not know the condition of any heart tonight, but what I know is your Holy Spirit is working in the hearts and lives of people as your word has been shared really over the last week and a half, two weeks um, the month of September as we've talked about the need and the urgency Lord I pray if there's someone here in our church family that you want to call and send I pray Lord that they would surrender their heart and their life Lord if there's someone here who just needs to surrender themselves to be willing to to give. I pray that tonight they would come. Maybe there's some who just need to come and offer their life to you. Maybe there's some that you're just calling to be faithful. You're not asking them to go to the end of the road and then keep on going. You're just asking them to go across the road. Lord, maybe there's some who need to come and pray for someone that they know and that they care about. Lord, if there's someone here tonight who does not know you as their Savior, I pray they would come. And let us have someone take the Bible and show them how they can be sure that before they leave this place tonight, they are forgiven and on their way to heaven because of what you did on the cross to pay for their sins. Lord, I pray you'd have your will and way in every heart tonight. May no one go away as the invitation is extended and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. If the Holy Spirit spoken to your heart this evening for any reason, you come tonight as we sing.